It's my great pleasure to introduce Juan Rivas. Um, I've been at Stanford, my name is Mark Horowitz, I've been at Stanford for a long time. And I remember it was about, I think, six or seven, six, seven years ago that we started thinking that we really should have somebody who's interested in the power and energy area. We've heard a lot about its really importance, and we haven't had somebody on the EE faculty for a while in that area. But, you know, when we started interviewing candidates, they all seemed a little bit boring and not very interesting. Um, and I remember we had a candidate that, you know, we thought was pretty interesting, and then we decided to call his advisor and say, you know, what do you think of this person? And he says, well, that person's really good, but, you know, if you're looking for somebody, you should hire Juan, and, um, who was at that time a happy faculty member at the University of Michigan. Uh, and we started talking with him, and I will say it was the most exciting kinds of conversation. I would never met a power person who, like, did things that I thought were amazing, like how you build a DC to DC converter that goes in an MRI machine where the um, basic uh, magnetic fields are so high you can't use any magnetic materials. Like, you know, that's actually an interesting thing. Or how do you use energy conversion to do propulsion in various ways? You know, that's another crazy idea. So, and then you go to his lab, and he has all these really small, you know, experiments, and he's always so excited to tell you about everything that's going on. He's been an amazing hire, an amazing colleague, and I, I'd like just to introduce Juan Rivas. Uh, hi, everyone. So it's, it's a really great honor to be here in Stanford. Like, it's been uh, an awesome time since I joined. Uh, so one, one thing... Uh, I like to tell people about like my experience here in Stanford is that like when I was at the University of Michigan and I received a phone call from John Pauly telling me if I was interesting, interested in um, to come to Stanford to interview, it actually was exactly the day on which I closed on my house in Michigan. <laughs> so, and, and I figured like, hey, yeah, what the heck, I can go to a place I cannot afford a house. So like, it's, uh, 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 but it's, it's, it's been an amazing ride, uh, particularly one of the things that I found interesting, it was that like, there was no power electronics program in, uh, in Stanford. That was one of the, the things that I was kind of like, surprised about. But also like, that's one of the things that made, make it, um, made it really attractive to me in order, uh, uh, and eventually decided to, 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 to come here. I like also another like uh, uh, thing that I like to t tell about like the, the that I don't think many people know about this, but I, I probably had like one of the worst um, interviews that I've had like in memory when I came to interview here in Stanford, and the reason is that like I decided to come a couple of days days before um, three days before uh, the, the the official interview here in Stanford. I came to visit a friend at, in the Bay Area. And like we went hiking and all that. And like, um, do you guys know poison oak? <laughs> well, it turns out that I don't. And uh, and apparently I sat on it or something. I, and uh, and like the day in the interview, I actually uh, was like oozing. Like uh, it was absolutely horrible. I had to go like constantly to the bathroom just to change shirts because like it, it was it was. Uh, and after the interview, I had to go to the hospital. And uh, uh, so when they hired me, I thought like. Man, they most felt bad about me, <laughs> but but it was it was a uh, 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 it, it, it's been amazing. Uh, so as part of that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the work that we do uh, here in Stanford on power electronics, and uh, and first I had to tell you about like what's power electronics. So power electronics is that uh, that is in between any power source and whatever you're trying to 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 to, to use that uses electricity. Uh, it's the uh, little power adapter that you hate because it's too big, too hot, or too expensive, and that you probably forgot before your trip, and you realize in the airport that you don't have an extra one. It's the DC-DC converter that like, uh, uh, regulates power to charge, uh, that ch uh, po power your phone. It's the uh, inverter that uh, you're glad you have when uh, PG&E uh, decides to shut off your power. Uh, or, or is the AC, AC to AC converter that sits between a wind generator and uh, the, the utility that lets you let us deliver power from uh, off, 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 offshore grid, uh, offshore wind farms into, into mainland, for example. One of the reasons I find fascinating power electronics is the scope. It's one of those areas that, like, uh, uh, there are several in, in, in electrical engineering that covers a very wide range in orders of magnitude on variables. So, like, so in power electronics, we deal with circuits that like uh, deliver power at the microwatt uh, level. On the same circuit techniques apply 
to, to uh, systems that can deliver gigawatts of power uh, to send uh, HVDC power from islands uh, to, to mainlands, in, for example, in this case in Italy, on the, on the picture on the right. So, but um, as many people have done it, and, and as always, like uh, Tom Lee uh, does masterfully, uh, there's uh, history behind it. So like, just imagine, again, I'm gonna borrow his um, time machine and uh, take us back again to the uh, late uh, 19 and 20, uh, 19th century, when the world was, um, the, the uh, commercial use of electricity was uh, flourishing, both in America and Europe. Communication was all based on telegraphy, wireless telegraphy and telephony. Uh, like, the, the users of electricity was electric motors, trolleys, subways, etc. Uh, lighting was also kind of a big load. We may, uh, Tom mentioned like uh, uh, arc lamps, incandescent light bulbs, and like we could see the beginnings of mercury lamps uh, 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 providing ghastly uh, illumination that, uh, that that was not very pretty but but useful. But most of the uh, power use, uh, like the vast majority of the power that was generated, was actually used in electrochemistry. So. Uh, Everyone uh, seemed to know about like the battle of the current between Tesla uh, and Edison, and like um, and how Tesla eventually won um, the, the 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 Tesla system won the contract that ended up being installed in Niagara Falls. Like most of the power that was generated for uh, from at uh, the beginning for um, uh, uh, Niagara Falls was used for aluminum smelting, and. Um, so those are kind of like what, what industry uh, was going on. At the time, if you wanted to control like the speed of a, of a trolley, for example, you had to use, uh, uh, like doing that with uh, AC systems, even though like already Tesla was becoming dominant, was not um, very easy. So like instead, people had to use DC, DC uh, uh, con control. And in order if you wanted to convert AC to DC, you had to use like contraptions like this because we didn't have uh, semiconductors fast enough that to, to, to do the job. So we had to use these machines. This is a rotary converter that like as a super simplified version of how this works, you can imagine that this is an AC motor that drives a DC generator such that like uh, it's incredibly inefficient, but it works and like uh, uh, they're, they're huge and always fun to, to, to run into like sometimes. So also around the same time, in about 1901, uh, Peter Cooper Hewitt uh, patented the mercury lamp. Again, they produce a very ghastly, like hospital looking light, but uh, they would start to be more um, like, like, uh, useful in some industrial settings. And uh, um, at the time they didn't have like really like, like uh, a good phosphorus coating, so, so, so the, the light was not good. But then he noticed that uh, current tend to flow only in a single direction. So as an engineer, like they realized that then, well, we can make rectifiers. We can uh, make uh, the beginnings of what uh, eventually behaves like a diode. So they come up with these amazing contraptions that are the mercury arc rectifier, that like it's a, a, a large a vacuum, vacuum bulb that has a pool of liquid uh, uh, mercury that like, um, uh, allows you uh, and, and a very interesting uh, starting mechanism that like allows you to um, make uh, rec rectify AC 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 power into DC. Um, you could see in uh, magazines advertisements for that. And like if you just had a question about how much these things cost back in 1934, they were about like seventeen dollars a pop. So uh, the the if you have never seen one. Uh, they look something like this. Uh, they're kind of like intimidating. Uh, they're, they're very interesting. And uh, I've been forever trying to get one from eBay I'm very unsuccessfully. And if you were to, to see how they actually uh, look when operating, there's just a picture of one that was used in a trolley in Edmonton all the way until 1990s. Like if you start, like they have this uh, bluish light that like uh, uh, makes it look like kind of it belongs to movies. Uh, like a Frankenstein movie, and actually, in fact, they were. So, like, they they were they were shown in like the the 1964 uh, version of Frankenstein, the movie, like right on the back. So it was fascinating to me to find that. So, uh, but then uh, we come up with semiconductors, and you guys kind of made that happen. So, like, uh, selenium rectifiers were introduced in the 30s. Then, in 54, Sylvania presented the first power transistor that was. 
related to a whopping one and a half watts. So in the 50s, GE introduced the first commercial silicon control rectifier. Now it's officially like uh, some, something that uh, can deliver significant amount of po power and voltages. And uh, the, that was originally developed by Bell Labs. In the 70s, in 1976, for, for the power MOSFETs are introduced in Lockheed's in the uh, L1011 airplane. And uh, uh, this is significant because um, in this experimental uh, implementation, they were operating at a frequency of 100 kilohertz in a switching converter. Remember, 100 kilohertz. Uh, in, the, in 78, Schwartz and our very own Jim Plummer like, developed the, uh, presented a paper on MOS control triac devices that like, exhibit uh, the, the characteristics, uh, performance characteristics of IGVTs, that devices that are later commercialized uh, uh, and are foundational in the uh, power, power electronics industry nowadays. Um, but uh, I mentioned in this Lockheed example that uh, the, switch, the MOSFETs that were used at the time were operating at 100 kilohertz back in the 70s. Uh, the reason uh, they operate at this frequency compared to the uh, switching converters uh, that are operating before using bipolar devices at frequencies of tens of kilohertz is because uh, the size and volume of power converters vary inversely with switching frequency. And um, that's what we've been doing in the power electronics as an industry, increase switching frequency in order to reduce and improve the power density, that reduce the size and improve the power density of power converters. So this is an example that um, what happened to converters as you increase switching frequency. So when you go from 72 kilohertz to 250 kilohertz, the power density of these 10 kilowatt systems like increase quite significantly to, to, an, to a power density of around 10 kilowatts per liter. If you were to double the switching frequency again to 500 kilohertz, you find that your power density now becomes 13 kilowatts per liter. And double in frequency again, uh, you notice that the power density keep increasing, but just marginally. And that's something that is happening uh, in power electronics today. As we go to higher and higher frequencies, we find that um, the, the, the gains of in, in performance and in improvements in power density are becoming marginal. There is, and there are many reasons for this. So, and it, even today, most of the co switching converters that are operating around the world operate between a frequency of 20 kilohertz to about 300 kilohertz. Again, remember that in the 70s, Lockheed was already operating at 100 kilohertz. So, but no problem. Wide band gap semiconductors to the rescue. So um, we in, we've been fortunate in power electronics that um, although silicon has had a, a great run, it's an amazing technology. There's two other semiconductor technologies, uh, three, five semiconductor technologies that promise to really change the way power electronics work. We have silicon carbide that has uh, electrical parameters that are much, much better than silicon in, in most cases in terms of band gap energy, critical energy, and thermal conductivity, et cetera. And we also have gallium nitride that also has uh, uh, much, much better electrical characteristics than silicon in many cases. Um, some of these uh, electrical parameters indicate that these devices in GAN and silicon carbide should allow uh, for larger, uh, higher voltage operations, higher switching frequency operation, and higher temperature operation. Uh, uh, in, in a plot that I, I stole from Jim Plummer, uh, it's, it's regularly shown that how um, when you plot the specific on resistance of uh, and the unipolar limit of uh, uh, devices made with these technologies, uh, uh, when you're operating at a, uh, at a given voltage, gallium nitride and silicon carbide I like orders of magnitude better than when you can achieve with silicon devices, making them like an awesome technology to look forward to in, in, in order to improve performance. Uh, uh, in, we, we see in power electronic publications that they pretty much portray them as superheroes. And, um, like we see companies uh, showing how uh, the advantages of this uh, silicon carbon gallium nitride technology that should allow systems that are 100 times faster and several times higher in power density than their silicon counterparts. Uh, but then we see in, uh, practical implementations of today's uh, systems that use uh, gallium nitride devices that like even though show good and large uh, high power densities, they are operating in the frequency range that are, again, 
around 300 kilohertz, only one or two, three times faster than systems that were uh, developed back in the 70s. So uh, the implementation on the right uh, uses some GAN devices from uh, Infineon and shows uh, operating frequencies in the 72 to 196 kilohertz for um, power converters that like, are, are uh, uh, available today. Again, not significant gains in, in switching frequency and performance. Uh, um, in the past year or so, it was introduced this uh, gallium nitride uh, power adapters that now you can buy on Amazon that have extraordinarily good uh, power densities, something in the order of around 20, 20 cubic centimeters on the own case case, which is a, it's a good uh, power density. Uh, and, and, and they show performance plots that show that these systems uh, operate quite efficiently over a wide uh, output voltage range. But one of the things that we start noticing in my group is that even though like these this, uh, um, available systems are quite remarkable, it turns out they are only marginally better than what you can do with silicon. We found uh, some um, app nodes from on, on semiconductors, for example, that use conventional cool MOSFETs, silicon MOSFETs, that uh, on a system that is just slightly larger than what uh, was implemented uh, on, on gallium nitride device, uh, that performs really, really well. Actually, performs in efficiency better than some of the devices that were uh, implemented on gallium nitride. And like the reason is the devices that like many gallium nitride manufacturers decided to uh, showcase as uh, examples of like the benefits of this technology are not well suited for uh, showing that. Uh, the, the size of the inductors and capacitors that are shown here are determined by the 60 hertz uh, frequency that uh, we connect things on is to absorb 120 hertz ripple. So it doesn't matter what switching frequency you operate at in your power electronics, these inductors and capacitors are roughly gonna be about the same size. So we want to change that. So one of the reasons that it becomes actually very difficult to operate at higher frequencies is inductors. Inductors uh, have usually a magnetic core that has lost components that increase really rapidly with frequency. And particularly, we want to operate at higher and higher frequencies than a few hundreds of kilohertz. We find that there's a lack of materials that are cap capable of operating at, at higher frequencies. And they're externally lossy with frequency. If we want to really change how power electronics work, if we want to increase, let's say, an order of magnitude in switching frequency on a power converter, we find that when we plot the, the core loss densities of the best of the best magnetic materials available, we find that for an increase of an order of magnitude in switching frequency, the loss density in magnetic materials grows up by two orders of magnitude, which is a losing proposition, which means if I really want to increase switching frequency to make things uh, smaller and more compact, I find that it's gonna get hot, right? So at some frequencies, it just makes sense to just eliminate the, the, air core, the, the, the magnetic core, and that's one of the things that has been driving my research. I often show this picture. So it shows like roughly uh, uh, what happens conventionally in power electronics. As we increase the switching frequency, power density increases. That has been happening for decades. But when we reach a frequency of a few hundred kilohertz, we reach this point of diminishing returns. We plateau in performance. If we were to design things at higher and higher frequency, at some point you find that things are starting to get too hot because of the magnetics and losses in, 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 in the semiconductors, et cetera, and the power density starts decreasing with frequency, and that seems kind of like to be the end of the road. But fundamentally, you can see that uh, it's fundamental that uh, as you increase switching frequency, the size of the inductors and capacitors that you need becomes smaller and smaller. So at, at some point, it actually makes sense to completely eliminate the magnetic core and make these systems with air core components. Unfortunately, that has a penalty because people like, people like uh, um, uh, um, cores for a reason. You can make relatively large inductors in a small volume, and I'm proposing to just eliminate them completely. So we're gonna be penalizing power density. But now we have eliminated one of the major sources of losses that increase with frequency, which means that I come back to the game of increasing power, uh, uh, switching frequency to gain back what I lost in power density. But in order to come, to come even or ahead, it's not necessary to increase only 
uh, to a switching frequency of one or two or three megahertz. I need to really blow this up into like tens of megahertz. And that comes up with enormous challenge in a circuit perspective, but also that are very exciting. Particularly, if I'm able to completely eliminate the magnetic cores in a, in, a, in a power converter, it means that I can make all the inductors and capacitors that I need to make a power converter by using the traces on a PCB, for example. So I can just pretty much just print a converter the, the same way you order a PCB today. I don't have to add pretty much any component, just a couple of semiconductors in it. And I can, I can leave the top and bottom layers undisturbed to function as uh, functional uh, Faraday shields, for example. So, uh, but in order to be able to operate at, at, at very high frequencies, there's a lot of things we need to do. Particularly, uh, we need to address issues with switching losses. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to come up with ideal switching devices for obvious reasons. And like here's an example of a very conventional power converter. And I'm plotting here the instantaneous voltage and current across the switch. Because the devices are not ideal, uh, it takes some time for the switches to turn on and off. That, that implies that there's going to be uh, uh, a time in which you have instantaneous uh, switching energy loss, instantaneous power loss, uh, every time you turn and off, on and off your, or your, your circuit. Which means that if I, as I'm proposing, we want to operate, say, 10 times or 20 times faster, it means that like, this loss mechanism is going to happen 10 or 20 times more often, increasing the losses even more. So we can use GAN, right? Well, not really, because like, even if you use the best of the best of semiconductor materials, like say GAN, for example, at this point, if we want to operate at the voltage that are normally encountered when we use uh, when, when we use like uh, line conversions at uh, AC, AC voltages, say 400 volts, if we are operating at a frequency even of at 100 kilohertz or so, the, the heat densities that you need to be able to extract from a, a GAN semiconductor are in the order of like the heat densities that you find in a fully functioning uh, CPU, which we know they get a little toasty. And if we want to operate at a frequency of 10 megahertz or so, you find that we have a problem. Right? You're going to have a very shining converter. So, so this is not possible. So in order to be able to really achieve this, to be able to operate at frequencies of 10 megahertz, we have to rely on circuits. We have to use resonance switching conversions. We have to add complexity to our system, something that engineers like to do so often. That like, we can add more inductors and capacitors to actively shape the voltage across the switch to resonate up and down on its own when you turn the switch off, such that the moment that you need to turn the switch on, the voltage is already zero, such that we completely eliminate that possibility of having switching loss in the, during the device. That, uh, allow us to uh, eliminate switching loss, and now we can really crank up the frequency enough. But now we have something that pretty much looks like a radio that becomes very sensitive to parameter variation, and we need to fabricate things carefully. But that's fun. Like now we can eliminate magnetic cores, and we can start making inductors, for example, using traces on a PCB board to make spirals, a piece of wire, uh, and a plastic core. Or most importantly or better, uh, stitch uh, the traces on a PCB board to form a toroidal inductor. That has other advantages because that allows me to uh, confine the magnetic, ma the magnetic fields to inside the torus. And that's something that we have done often in my group. So we've been successful in demonstrating switching converters, for example, this is a picture of a converter that all the inductors and capacitors were implemented using traces on PCBs operating at a frequency of 27 megahertz, and it's able to deliver uh, hundreds of watts quite efficiently. So uh, one of the things that we know at these frequencies is uh, we are hit by skin depth. That means like current tends to flow to a very, very shallow depth on the conductor that, that we're using. Particularly at 10 megahertz, this is only 20.6 microns. So for most of this structure, of this structure, the current is only thrown to a tiny, tiny sliver of copper on the top of the material. So we thought perhaps we can exploit that. So uh, we've been using this in several applications. So for example, um, uh, um, uh, Mark mentioned uh, electric propulsion. We partner with uh, the Australian National University who develop a satellite, a miniature satellite thruster, that, but they just didn't know how to power it. 
So this is an electrothermal thruster that like, when you uh, release some um, propellant, uh, you can get some thrust. Well, at the time that you release that propellant, you can inject energy to turn it into plasma, and that pretty much forces like a, a kind of a mini explosion that helps you uh, improve your uh, specific impulse quite significantly. So uh, we put it together for a demonstration. So we built a CubeSat satellite thruster that is 10 centimeters on the side. Uh, the thruster passes right through the middle of the, uh, the PCB board, and we developed the uh, control avionics and whatnot. Our collaborators uh, developed the uh, gas distribution systems, and we demonstrated this in vacuum, uh, being able to, to generate uh, plasma and produce thrust, and now we are uh, trying to find uh, opportunities to actually demonstrate it in, in space. So if you guys, uh, anyone from you are from SpaceX or so? Hello? <laughs> so, so we hope we had a chance in, a, in, in the next year or so to demonstrate this in space. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned, we have issues with uh, skin depth. So we decided to explore that uh, uh, better, particularly um, the, the, the type of inductor that you can make in a PCB boards are far from ideal, particularly because you are only constrained to having a square cross sections. Uh, so we thought perhaps we can come up with a design that we can consider as ideal as possible in a computer, for example. Then we can analyze it in a FEM program to, to kind of have a, an indication of the predicted uh, inductance and capacitance that we need. And like leveraging the fact that at these frequencies of operation, we don't need magnetic materials, we can 3D print a low weight scaffold that has the, uh, the geometric properties of whatever inductor I would like that is very, very lightweight. And I only need to uh, electroplate it with a very, very thin layer of copper, more than 20 micros or so, uh, uh, to, to render it conductive and to have the electrical properties that I need. But I'm not gonna be into the business of printing inductors, instead I want to print converters. So we want to see if it's possible to 3D print, to 3D print uh, full power converters. That, um, so we, we have done this, we had a collaboration with Professor Mark Capelli in mechanical engineering to 3D print a uh, plasma thruster, uh, completely 3D printed, and we were able to shed the weight of our PCB uh, version by 50% or so. The scaffold of this structure only weighs about a gram. So we, we put it together to make a, a 25 watt uh, plasma thruster that again is, is really incredible, it gets the students motivating into building things and innovating how we fabricate things. It's, it's very exciting. Then I want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that I find it very exciting on high voltage converters. So in power electronics, like what my colleagues in the industry have done, it's an amazing job on making small power supplies that bring uh, line voltages to voltages that you need in a microprocessor. One of the best uh, uh, systems that we could fi find out there has a power, power levels of around 1.7 kilowatts, efficiencies in the 98 percentile or so, and densities that can reach almost three kilowatts per cubic inch. It's really, really amazing for micro, like powering microprocessors and servers. But in scientific uh, in, uh, applications, and uh, we find that when you try to get high voltage converters, the power density that we have achieved as a power electronics industry is kind of like lame. Uh, notice that like for these commercial products, uh, power supplies that are in the few kilovolts have power densities that are no more than 10 watts per cubic inch. Compare three kilowatts per cubic inch to 10 watts per cubic inch. So we thought perhaps there's something we can do about this. So uh, several years ago, my students and I uh, come up with a design that was able to deliver um, power at 27 megahertz from 40 volts to uh, input to about 500 volts output. And of course, I wish I, I could, but I don't have time to go through the details of how this works, but contact me if you want to. And, uh, and I'm just gonna focus on the rectifier part of this system. So this is a system that takes DC to a ref, it matches to an appropriate load, and then rectifies it back to DC. So I'm gonna just zoom in at the, at the rectifier. And because we are operating an insanely high frequency for what is commercially possible, so we thought, at 27 megahertz, the size of capacitor that you need here is so tiny that we might afford having two of them. We can have split this capacitor in two and have two capacitors in series, 
connecting the second one in the return. And that what it, this allows is full DC isolation from this left part of the circuit to the right, which means that you can take many, many, many of these converters and you can connect several of them uh, rectifiers at the input and cascade and connect the outputs in serials to achieve high voltage gain. So that's kind of what we did. And we've been like working, uh, we had some uh, work funded by NASA to show if this has uh, some um, applications for, for satellite applications particularly. So one of my students uh, put together a 40 volts in to two kilovolts out converter that operates at 13 mega, me megahertz and only weights about 20 grams. And it happens that like that to be, uh, NASA was really, really impressed about that. It really, like this is a one inch cube uh, system. Uh, to give you an idea of how this is stand for anything that is commercially available, we find that the power density that we can achieve is about three times better than anything that we could find out there that would be similar. Plus, we are not affected by magnetic fields. Uh, one of my students, as part of his PhD dissertation, decided to show off by like comparing this commercial uh, 250 watts, four kilovolts power supply, uh, he decided to implement a credit card size version of the same system that delivers the same power, the same voltages. So this is a 30 volts in, four kilovolts out that achieves an, a much higher efficiency and a power density, a uh, volume, volume that is about 20, 20 to 30 times smaller than a commercial product. And because of the switching frequency, it's infinitely faster. We have the ability to turn on and off in microseconds, and we're trying to uh, use it in interesting applications. One of my students like, started to go crazy with this, and like, he came up with this converter that uh, combines capacitive and inductive isola uh, isolation to, um, to come up with a converter that takes 45 volts at the, at the input and delivers five kilovolts at the outputs that are fully, fully isolated and capable of connecting many of this, so he potted the hell out of this, such that he can connect 20 of this to achieve an output, total output voltage of 100 kilovolts. So this is a converter that takes 45 volts in and delivers a whopping 100 kilovolts and it's the size of a launch box. And in terms of power density, again, it's several times better than when we could find anything commercially. And we are considering, and if you're asking, like, what is this guy wanted to build 100 kilovolts converters is because we're trying to target uh, scientific x-ray applications. Uh, there's uh, many applications out there uh, that require power volt uh, voltages in the 50 to 125 kilovolt range with the power levels and that we can probably achieve. And uh, one of the applications that we're kind of targeting is perhaps the ones that you need in a CT scanner. In a medical CT scanner, you have a high voltage power supply that power the x-ray tube, and all this gantry rotates at very, very high speed. And sometimes there are limitations on how fast these things can, can spin, and in part is because of the, the weight of the systems. Um, and uh, we working in other uh, areas to, that, that achieve this high voltage conversion. So particularly, uh, we have this system that delivers two, two kilowatts Two kilowatts, uh, two kilowatts at, uh, uh, at two kilovolts. That again achieves a power density that really, really is much, much uh, uh, higher than anything we have been uh, uh, able to find commercially. Uh, that uses both silicon carbide and GAN. And a lot of part of the work in my group uh, tried to use uh, to, to leverage this semiconductor technology to, to, to really. Um, demonstrate how good they can be. And lastly, I just wanted to share a story that happened like recently. So uh, earlier last year, sometime last year, like around uh, in the fall last year, DARPA came up with a call for proposals that they called for a program called SHRIMP. And for that program, they wanted a high voltage power supply for micro robotics that needed three kilovolts uh, supply. So they needed a three volts in, three kilovolts out power converter. And for phase one for that program, they wanted something that was about a third of a cubic centimeter for about a two, 200 milliwatt uh, converter. Uh, that was supposed to last for about a year and a half. Then for, for the next phase, the goal for the second phase was uh, reduce, improve the power density, bring it, this back to about 0.2 uh, cubic centimeters. 
uh, half a gram, and again, three kilovolts. So of course we applied. We were very excited of the work we're doing in high voltage, so like we applied for, for this project, but I'm sad to report that we didn't get the project. But it doesn't matter. One of the students that helped me write this proposal got really upset we didn't got the, <laughs> with the project, and mostly because like the criticism that we received was that they didn't see a viable path for us to scale down in power to what we had accomplished uh, in high voltage conversion. So my student asked me if he could work on this anyway. So I gave him $1,000 and a month to work on this. So this is what he did. So he uh, built, he, there's no research here. This really was an implementation in a month of his work. So he put together a, a Chinese manufacturer that he found online. He put a converter that was able to achieve the phase two DARPA uh, pro projects with a thousand bucks. So we wanted to demonstrate that in a DARPA kind of way. So like in order to be able to meet this, this specification, what he did is he put all the converter stages and all the components on a very thin uh, flex board and then just origami the hell out of it. And uh, he came up with a converter that weights about a quarter of a gram, uh, delivers more power than they wanted, and like, uh, and the voltage that they want. So we, of course, went to DARPA to see, tell them that like, hey, thank you for not giving us the money. It'd make us do it anyway. So we wanted to demonstrate in a DARPA kind of way. So without uh, telling the, the program manager, we presented this in a conference. So what we did was, uh, uh, it turns out that there's a phenomenon called electroaddition that you can uh, pretty much form interdigitated uh, electrodes. Then when you power them with a relatively high voltage, the electric field can be used for, uh, uh, to, to ad adhere thing electrostatically. So we pair that to a small drone, like the, the smallest drone that we can find on, on Amazon that has a wireless camera. And then we, we build this perch and stair drone that pretty much let us uh, fly the drone, fly it to the ceiling, get stuck in the ceiling, and you can like still rec like turn, off your, uh, um, turn off the motor so you don't just say power and you could stay able to record there. And with that, um, I'd really like to thank all the, all the support that I've received from Stanford, all the uh, great faculty that I like, really have uh, helped me, uh, uh, that have mentored me and helped me like, uh, uh, achieve uh, a lot of the work that we've done. Also the fantastic staff that makes uh, everyone think that I actually know what I'm doing. Uh, uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>